So today we're reading chapters 8 and 9. And as we're reading, you need to be taking notes about characters and notes about settings. So get a paper, uh, make a little T-chart, two columns, notes about characters, and notes about settings. At the end of chapter 7, <clears throat> um, Bud was able to um, get food from the mission. He was able to go to the library, get an update on Miss Hill. Um, and he, uh, he leaves the library, and he understands that um, Miss Hill's not going to be able to help him. And he says that the library door closed, and he says that he knew that was the next... That was the exact kind of door that his mama had told him about. And he knew that something was getting ready to happen. So he is still kind of hiding out underneath the evergreen trees out of outside of the library. <clears throat> but not Buddy, Chapter 8. Something stepped on a little stick. As soon as the twig cracked, my eyes snapped open and I was wide awake. I held my breath and kept as still as I could. Whatever it was that was sneaking up on me knew I'd woke up because it stopped moving and kept as still as it could too. Even though my head was still under my blanket, I could feel two eyes staring at me real hard and I knew that these weren't critter eyes. These eyes made the hair on the back of my neck raise up the way only human beings' eyes can do. Hang on, kid. Without wiggling or jiggling around too much under my blanket, I got my fingers wrapped around my jackknife. Right when I was ready to push the covers off of me and start running or stabbing, whoever it was that had been watching jumped right on top of me. I was trapped as a I was trapped as a roach under a dish rag. I tried to guess the exact spot that the person's heart was at, then pulled my knife back. No, a voice said, "If you ain't called, if you ain't a kid called Bud from the home, I'm real sorry about jumping on you like this." It was Bugs. When I tried to talk, it felt like I had to suck all the air out of Flint. I finally got breathing right and said, Doggone it, Bugs, it is me. You nearly scared me to death. He got off of me and I threw the blanket over to the side. You don't know how lucky you are. I was just about fixing to stab you in the heart. Bugs looked like he knew he just had a real close call. He said, I'm sorry, Bud. I didn't mean to scare you, but everybody knows how you like to sleep with that knife open. So I figured I'd best grab hold of you so you wouldn't wake up slicing nobody. <clears throat> Shucks, even though it was Bugs who'd come real close to getting his heart poked, I was the one who was still having trouble catching my breath. I asked, how come you aren't back at the home? But before he had a chance to answer, I knew, you're on the lam. Bug said, yup, I'm going back to riding the rails. When I heard about you beating that kid up so bad that you had to take off, I figured it was time for me to get going too. I thought you might be hanging around the library, so I come down to see if you wanted to go with me. Where are you heading? There's always fruits to be picked out west. I heard we can make enough money to get by out there. There's supposed to be a train leaving sometime tomorrow. Did you really beat that kid up in the foster home? I said, uh-huh, we kind of had a fight. How long does it take to get out west? <clears throat> Bug said, depends on how many trains you got to hop. Was he really two years older than you? Uh-huh, he was 12. Is it fun to hop a train? Some of the time it is. Some of the time it's scary. We heard he was kind of big too, was he? I said, he was pretty big. I can't see how we can hop on a train. They look like they're moving pretty doggone fast. Bug said, most times you don't hop on them when they're going fast. Most times you try to climb on one when it's sitting in the train yard. Did the guy cry after you whooped him? Well, kind of. He looked real scared, then told his mama to keep me away from him. 
They even said I was a hoodlum. Will we be sleeping on the train and everything? Sure we will. Some of the time the train don't stop for two or three days. Man, I always try to tell people that just because someone's skinny, it don't mean they can't, they can't fight. You're a hero now, bud. No, I really didn't do mu nothing much. Well, how about the toilet? How are we supposed to use the toilet if the train doesn't stop? Bug said, you just kind of lean out of the door and go. When the train is moving? Yeah, you get a real nice breeze. Oh, man, that sounds great. Count me in. I can't wait. <clears throat> Bugs spit a big glob of slob in his hand and said, I knew I could depend on you, bud. I spit a big glob in my hand and said, We're brothers forever, Bugs. We slapped our hands together as hard as we could, and we got our slobs mixed up real good, then waved them in the air so they'd dry. Now it was official. I finally had a brother. Bugs said, we'll go down to the mission. There's bound to be someone there that knows about where we can hop this train, and then we'll be on the lamp together. We found out that we'd have to go to a city called Hooperville, just outside of Flint. <clears throat> the only trouble was that nobody knew exactly where Hooperville was. It was dark before we found out the right direction. I'd never heard of a city that was so doggone hard to find. <clears throat> we walked on a trail through some woods that run right up against Thread Creek. We could tell we were getting close to Hooperville because we heard somebody playing a mouth organ and the smell of food cooking was getting stronger. We kept walking in the direction that the sky was blowing, was glowing with an orangish light. When we could hear the music real clear and folks talking to each other and the sound of sticks crackling in a fire, we started cutting through the trees. That way we could peek into Hooperville first. We looked out from behind a big tree and saw that a big wind or even two or three big wolves huffing and puffing real hard could blow Hooperville into the next county. It was a bunch of huts and shacks thrown together out of pieces of boxes and wood and cloth. The Amos's shed would have looked like a real fancy house here. Right near our tree <clears throat> was the big fire that had been lighting up the sky. It looked like a hundred people were sitting around it, watching things burn or waiting for the food cooking in three big pots set up in the fire. There were two littler fires burning in, burning in Hooperville. One had a pot that was big enough to boil a whole person in it. A man was stirring things in the pot with a big stick. And when he raised the stick up, he'd pull up some britches or a shirt and pass it over to a white man who was hanging the clothes on a line to dry. There was a mountain on the clothes on the ground next to them, waiting on their turn. The other fire in Hooperville was real small. It was off to the side by itself. There were five people, five white people sitting at this fire. Two kids, a man, and a woman holding a little wrapped up baby. The baby sounded like all those new sick babies at the home. It was coughing like it was a half-dead little animal. Bugs whispered, shoot, this ain't no city. This is just another cardboard jungle. A what? A cardboard jungle. Somewhere you could get off the train and clean up and get something to eat without the cops chasing you out of town. I said, well, what are we going to do? We can't just go busting into this city and expect someone to feed us, can we? Bugs said, one of us has got to go talk to him. Let's flip for it. Okay. Bugs rumbled around in his pocket and found a penny. He rubbed it up against his britches and said, Heads I win, tails you lose. Okay. He flipped the penny up into the air and caught it, then slapped it down on the back of his left hand. He peeked underneath his right hand to see, and a big smile cracked his face. Shucks, Bug said. Tails, you lose. Dang, so what should I say? Ask them if this is Hooperville. See if they got any extra food. 
I moved out from behind our tree and walked over to the biggest fire. I waited until some folks noticed me, then said, Excuse me, is this here Hooperville? The man who was playing the mouth organ stopped, and everyone else around the fire looked up at me. One of the white men said, What is it you're looking for? I said, A city called Hooperville, sir. And they all laughed. <clears throat> The mouth organ man said, Nah, son, what you're looking for is Hooverville, with a V, like, like in President Herbert Hoover. I said, Oh, is this it, sir? The man said, This is one of them. I said, One of them? He answered, They're all over the country. This here is the Flint version. And uh, all of them are called Hooverville? That's right, Mr. Hoover worked so hard at making sure every city has got one that it seems like it would be criminal to call him anything else. Someone said, that's the truth. I said, well, how do we know if we're in the right one? The mouth organ man said, are you hungry? Yes, sir. Are you tired? Yes, sir. Are you scared about what's going to happen tomorrow? <clears throat> I didn't want anyone to think I was a baby, so I said, not exactly scared, sir, but I am a little bit nervous. The man smiled and said, Well, son, any place there's other folks in need of the same things that you are is the right place to be. This is exactly the Hooverville you're looking for. I knew what the man was trying to say. <clears throat> this was the exact same kind of circle talking and cross talking that Mama used to do. Bugs hadn't had that kind of practice. He came from the hunt from behind the tree and said, I don't get it. You said there were Hoovervilles all over the place. What if we was looking for the Hooverville in Detroit or Chicago? How could this be the right one to be in? The man said, You boys from Flint? I said, Yes, sir. The man waved his mouth organ like a magic wand and pointed it all over the cardboard city. Boys, he said, Look around you. <clears throat> the city was bigger than I thought it was. The raggedy little huts were in every direction you looked. And there were more people sitting around than I first thought, too. Mostly it was, big, big, it was men and big boys. But there were a couple of women every now and then, and a kid or two. They were all the colors you can think of. Black, white, brown. But the fire made everyone look like they were different shades of orange. There were dark orange folks sitting next to medium orange folks sitting next to light orange folks. All these people, the mouth organ man said, are just like you. They're tired, hungry, and a little bit nervous about tomorrow. This here is the right place for y'all to be because we're all in the same boat. And you boys are nearer to home than you'll ever get. Someone said, Amen, brother. <clears throat> The mouth organ man said, <clears throat> It don't matter if you're looking for Chicago or Detroit or Orlando or Oklahoma City. I'll rule the trails to all of them. You might think or you might hear that things are better just down the line, but they're singing the same sad song all over this country. Believe me, son, being on the road is no good. If you two boys are from Flint, this is the right Hooverville for you. Someone said, Brother, why don't we feed these boys? That one looks like he ain't eaten in two or three months. Shucks, he didn't have to point or nothing. Everyone knew who he meant. I didn't care. The food was bubbling up in those three big pots. Even sounded delicious. The mouth organ man said, You're welcome to join us, but we all pitch in here. So, unless one of you is carrying one of them smoked West Virginia hams in them bags, it looks like you'll be pulling KP tonight. I said, pulling what, sir? He said, KP, kitchen police. You do the cleanup after everyone's had their fill. There's a couple other young folks who will show you what you have to do. Me and Bugs both said, yes, sir. This seems like a real good trade. <clears throat> a woman handed me and Bugs each a flat, square, empty tin can. That, my lords, is your china. 
Be careful not to chip it. My china had the words Jumbo A and P sardines stamped into the bottom of it. She handed us two beat up old spoons and said, Don't be shy, you two just about missed supper. You'd best hurry up. She took us over to one of the big pots and filled up our tin plates. You're lucky, she said. It's muskrat stew and there's plenty left over tonight. Eat as much as you can. The stew was made out of dandelion greens and a couple of potatoes and some small wild carrots and some crawdads and a couple of little chunks of meat. It tasted great. We both even got seconds. When we were done, the woman told us, You boys leave your bags here. It's time to do the dishes now. Uh-oh. <clears throat> Ma'am, I'd like to keep my suitcase with me wherever I go. I promise your, you your suitcase will be safe here. I remembered the Amoses had promised the same thing. I said, You'll watch it yourself, ma'am. You'll make sure no one looks inside of it. <clears throat> she said, Son, we don't have no thieving here. We all look out for each other. I said, Thank you, ma'am, and put my suitcase down near the woman's feet. Me, Bugs, a little white boy, and a little girl loaded a whole mess of dirty tin cans and spoons and a couple of real plates and forks into a big wooden box and lugged them down to Thread Creek. The little girl had been in Hooverville the longest, so she got to tell the rest of us what to do. She said, I don't suppose neither of you new boys knows how to do the dishes the right way, do ya? Me and Bugs had done tons of dishes in the home. So I said, sure we do. We used to be real good at cleaning up. Bugs said, dang, girl, you act like this is the first cardboard jungle I've been in. I know how you do the dishes at here. She said, okay, then we'll split up. You and you, she pointed to Bugs and the other kid, can do half. And me and this boy can do the others. What's your name? I said, Bud, not Buddy. She said, I'm Deza Malone. Deza handed Bugs and the other little boy some rags and some soap powder, and they started splashing the dishes in the water. Me and the girl walked a little farther up the creek and started unloading the rest of the dishes. You dry, I'll wash, she said. She handed me a rag, and just as soon she'd splashed one of the tin cans in the water and give it to me to dry, I'd dry it and stick it in the wooden box. She said, where'd you say you was from? Flint, right here. So you and your friend come down here to get on that train tomorrow? Where's it going? Chicago, she said. Is that west from here? Uh-huh. Then, yep, that's where we're heading, I said. Where are you from? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. You gonna take the train too? She said, uh-uh, my daddy is. Folks say there's work out west, so he's gonna try again. So you're gonna wait here for him? Uh-huh. She was real fast at washing the dishes, but I got she, but I noticed she got kind of slow and was touching my hand a lot when it came to giving them to me. She said, where's your mama and daddy? My mother died four years ago. Sorry to hear that. It's okay, she didn't suffer or nothing. So where's your daddy? I think he lives in Grand Rapids. I never met him. Sorry to hear that. Shucks, she held right onto my hand when she said that. I squirmed my hand loose and said, that's okay too. Deza said, no, it's not, and you should quit pretending that it is. Who said I'm pretending anything? I know you are. My daddy says families are the most important thing there is. That's why me and my mama are going to wait together for him to come back or write for us to come to him. I said, my mother said the same thing, that families should be there for each other all the time. She always used to tell me that no matter where I went or what I did, that she'd be there for me. Even if she wasn't somewhere that I could see her, she told me, Shucks, there's some folks who will have you run in your mouth before you know what you're doing. 
I quit talking and acted like I was having a real hard time drawing the tin can she just handed me. What'd she tell you, bud? I looked at Deza Malone and figured I'd never see her again in my life, so I kept shooting off my mouth. She would tell me every night before I went to sleep that no matter what happened, I could sleep knowing that there had never been a little boy anywhere, anytime, who was loved more than she loved me. She told me that as long as I remembered that, I'd be okay. And you knew it was the truth. Just as much as I know my name's Bud, not Buddy. She said, don't you have no other kin here in Flint? No. I guess I can't blame you for wanting to ride the rails. My mama says these poor kids on the road all alone are just like dust in the wind. But I guess you're different, aren't you, Bud? I guess you sort of carry your family around inside of you, huh? I guess I do. Inside my suitcase, too. She said, so you've been staying in an orphanage since your mama died? What makes you say that? Well, you're kind of skinny, but I can tell by the way you talk and by the way you act that you haven't been on the, out on the road for very long. You still look young. I said, shucks, I'm not all that young. I'm going to be 11 on November 14th, and I'm not skinny. I'm wiry. Some folks think I'm a hero. So, Mr. Hero, we're the same age, but you have been staying in an orphanage. I've been staying in a home. My daddy says being on the road ain't fit for a dog, much less a kid. How come you just don't go back to your orphanage? She started up touching my hand too much again. Deza Malone seemed like she was all right, so I came clean with her. Don't tell no one, but I lit out from a foster home, so I'm on the lam. And I wouldn't go back to the home even if I could. It's getting so there's too many kids in there. So, that's better than being cold and hungry all the time and dodging the railroad police. What do you mean? You don't think they just let people jump on the trains, do you? Well, I guess I hadn't thought about it. <clears throat> See, I knew you were too nice to have been out on the road. You're going to have a bad surprise tomorrow morning. That won't bother me too much, she said. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You're a hero to some folks. When Deza smiled, a little dimple jumped up at her brown cheek. I didn't answer. I just kept drying tin cans. We got to the last four or five tin can plates, and Deza said, you ever kiss a girl at the orphanage? Uh-oh. Are you kidding? No. Why? Are you afraid of girls? You must be kidding. She said, okay, and closed her eyes and mushed her lips up and leaned close to me. Dangy. If I didn't kiss her, she'd think I was, a sc I was scared of girls. If I did kiss her, she might blab or bugs might see me and tell all the strangers about what happened. I looked down the creek to where Bugs and the other boy were still splashing in the water. It was dark enough that I didn't think they could see us too good. I scooched my lips up and mashed my face on Deza Malone's. We stuck like that for a hot second, but it felt like a long time. When I opened my eyes and pulled back, Deza kept hers closed and smiled. She looked down and stuck her hand in mine again, and this time I let her keep it there. She looked out at the creek and the woods and on the other side and said, Isn't this romantic? I looked out to see what she was talking about. The only thing I could see was the moon like a big egg yolk way up in the sky. You could hear the water and the sound of the mouth organ man playing a sad song back in Hooverville. I sneaked another peek at Deez's dimple. She said, You hear that? That Shannon doll he's playing. Isn't it pretty? I guess so. Do you know the words? Uh-uh. Listen. It's been seven long years since I've last seen her. Way hey, you rollin' river. Been seven long years since I've last seen her. Way hey, I'm bound away. 
across the wide Missouri. I said, yep, that's a sad song. I didn't think it was pretty at all. She squeezed my hand and said, isn't it? It's about an Indian man and woman who can't see each other for seven years, but in all that time, they still stay in love no matter what happens. It reminds me of my mother and father. Your dad's been gone for seven years before? She looked out over the creek like a, like the big eggy moon had her hypnotized. I pulled my hand back from hers and said, well, that's just about it for the dishes. She smiled again, but I'll never forget this night. I didn't tell her, but I probably wouldn't forget it either. I practiced on the back of my hand before, but this was the first time I'd ever busted slob with a real live girl. We loaded all the dishes in the box and walked down to Bugs and the other kid. We put their dishes on top of ours and headed back. Bugs said, how come you're looking so strange, bud? You look like you've been chunked in the head with a rock. Deza Malone laughed, and for a second I thought she was going to rat me out. I said, I don't know, I guess that song's making me kind of sad. Bugs said, yeah, it is kind of sad. Right before we got into the cardboard jungle, we passed the white people with the coffin baby at their own little fire. I said to Deza, how come they're off alone? They aren't allowed to sit around the big fire because their baby's making so much noise? Deza said, uh-uh, they've been invited, but my daddy says you got to feel sorry for them. All they're eating is dandelion green soup. They're broke, their clothes are falling off of them, their baby's sick, but when someone took them some food and blankets, the man said, thank you very much, but we're white people. We ain't in need of a handout. When we got back to the main fire of Hooverville, we put the dishes in another box. Deza made us all turn them upside down so if the rain got into them, they wouldn't rest. I went to the woman with my suitcase. It was in the same spot I'd left it, and the knots in the twine were the kind I tie. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. She said, I told you not to worry. I went back to the big fire to sit with bugs. The mouth organ man said, I suppose you boys are going out on that train tomorrow? I said, the one for Chicago, sir? He said, that's the one. I said, yes, we are, sir. He said, well, you'd best get as much sleep as you can. It's supposed to be pulling out at 515, but you never know with these freights. We got in one of the shacks with some other boys. Bugs was snoring in two seconds, but I couldn't sleep. I opened my jackknife and put it under my blanket. I was thinking, Deza's mama was right. Someone who doesn't know who their family is is like dust blowing around in a storm. They don't really belong any one place. I started wondering if going to California was the right thing to do. I might not know who my family was, but I knew they were out there somewhere. And it seemed to make a whole lot more sense to think that they were somewhere around Flint instead of out west. I opened my suitcase to get my blanket. Even though I trusted the woman who'd guarded it for me, I checked to make sure everything was okay. I picked up the, the tobacco pouch that had my rocks in it and pulled the drawstring open. I shook the five smooth stones out and looked at them. They'd been in that drawer after the ambulance took Mama away, and I'd had them ever since. Someone had took a pen or something and had writ on all five of them, but it was writ in a code, so I couldn't understand what they meant. One of them said, Kent Land Inn, 5, 10, 11. Another said, Luguti Inn, 5, 16, 11. And then there was Sturgis Inn, 8, 30, 12, and Gary Inn, 6, 13, 12. And the last one said Flint Inn, 8, 11, 11. I put them back in their pouch and pulled the string tight. Then I pulled out the envelope that had the picture of the saggy pony at the Miss B. Gotten Moon Park, 
It was fine. Next, I counted the flyers again. All five were there. I slid all of them back, except for the blue one. I held it up so that it could catch some light from the big fire. I kept looking at the picture and wondering why this one bothered Mama so much. The more I thought about it, the more I knew this man just had to be my father. Why else would Mama keep these? I used a little trick to help me fall off to sleep. I pulled the blanket right up over my head and breathed in the smell real deep. After doing this three times, the smells of the shack and Hooverville were gone, and only the smell of the blanket was in my nose. And that smell always reminded me of Mama and how she used to read me to sleep every night. I took two more breaths and pretended I was hearing Mama read to me about the billy goat's gruff or the fox and the grapes or the dog that saw his reflection in the water or some other story she'd checked out of the library. I could hear Mama's voice getting farther and farther away as I imagined I was in the story until finally her voice and the story all mixed into one. I'd learned that it was best to be asleep before Mama finished the story because if she got done and I was still awake, she'd always tell me what the story was about. I never told Mama, but that always meant the fun, but that always meant the fun of the story. Not sure. There's some typos in this version. I don't think that word's supposed to be meant there. Ruined, maybe? Shucks, here I was thinking I was just hearing some funny story about a fox or a dog. Now, Mama spoiled that by telling me there were really lessons about not being greedy or not wishing for things that you couldn't have. I took two more breaths and started thinking about the little hen that baked the bread. I heard, not I, said the pig. Not I, said the goat. Not I, said the big bad wolf. Then, whoop, zoop, sloop, I was asleep. I started dreaming about the man with the giant fiddle. He was walking away and I kept calling him, but he couldn't look back. Then the dream got a lot better. I turned away from where Herman E. Calloway was and there stood Deza Malone. I told her, I really like your dimple. She laughed and said, see you in seven years. A man screamed, get up, they're trying to sneak it out early. I jumped straight up and banged my head on the top of the shack. I ran outside. It was still dark and the fire was just a pile of glowing sticks. The man was screaming at the top of his lungs, get up, they fired the engine and are fixing to take off. Bugs and the other boys came and stood next to me. Bugs said, is it a raid? Someone said, no, they're trying to sneak out before we get up. People started running all over Hooverville. Bug said, come on, bud, get your stuff. We got to get on that train. I folded my blanket up and put it in my suitcase and tied the twine back. I put my jackknife in my pocket and Bugs and I ran outside. I hadn't got six giant steps away when a boy stuck his head out the door and yelled, hey, Slim, is this your paper? I looked back. My blue flyer. I forgot to put it in the suitcase. Bug said, hurry, I'll wait. I'll catch you, go ahead. I ran back and took my flyer from the boy. Thanks a lot. I ran back out into the crowd that was tearing through the woods. There were a million men and boys running in the same direction. I didn't want to fold the flyer up as I was running, I, so I slid it between the twine and the suitcase. And I'd put it back inside once we got on the train. No one was talking. All you could hear was the sounds of a million feet smacking on the trail and the sound of a million people trying to catch their breath. Finally, a hiss started sounding, a hiss sound started getting louder and louder, and I knew we weren't too far away. We broke out of the woods, and there in the dark sat the train. The locomotive was hissing and spitting cold black smoke into the sky. Every once in a while, a big shower of sparks would glow up from inside the dark cloud, making it look like a gigantic black genie was trying to rise up out of the smokestack. 
The train went as far back as you could see. There must have been a thousand boxcars. But everyone had stopped and was just standing there watching. No one was trying to get on. I pushed my way to the front to see if I could find bugs and saw why everyone had stopped. There were four cop cars and eight cops standing between the crowd and the train. The cops all had billy clubs and were spread out to protect the train. The crowd kept getting bigger and bigger. One of the cops said, you know, you men know you can't get on this train. Just go back to Shantytown and there won't be no trouble. A white man said, this is the only train going west for the next month. You know we got families to feed and have got to be on it. You go get back in your cars and you'll be right. There won't be no trouble. The cop said, I'm warning you. The Flint police are on their way, and this here is private property, and they have orders to shoot anyone who tries to get on this train. A man next to me said, I'd rather been shot than sit around and watch my kids go hungry. The cop said, this is America, boys. You're sounding like a bunch of commies. You know I can't let you on this train. I got kids to feed, too, and I'd lose my job. Someone yelled, well, welcome to the club, brother. It seemed like we stood looking at the cops and them looking at us for a whole hour. Our side was getting bigger and bigger, and the other cops started looking nervous. The one who was, all, who was doing all the talking saw them fidgeting and said, Hold steady, men. One of the cops said, Jake, there's 400 men out there and more coming. I don't like these odds. Mr. Pinkerton ain't paying me enough to do this. He threw his cop hat and his billy club on the ground. Everybody froze when the train whistle blew one long time and the engine started saying, shh, shh, shh. The big steel wheels creaked a couple of times, then started moving. Four of the other cops threw their hats and billy, club da billy clubs down too. The boss cop said, you lily-livered rats. And it was like someone said, on your mark, get set, go. The engine was saying, shh, 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 And a million boys and men broke for the train. I got pushed from behind and fell on top of my suitcase. Someone reached down and pulled me up. I squeezed my bag to my stomach and ran. The train was going faster and faster. People were jumping on it and reaching back to help the others. I finally got to the tracks and was running as hard as I could. I looked up into the boxcar and saw Bugs. He screamed, Bud, throw your bag, throw me your bag. I used both hands to throw my suitcase at the train. Bugs caught it and we, when he set it behind him, the blue flyer blew out of the twine and fluttered outside the door. Boy, it was like a miracle. The flyer flipped over three times and landed right in my hand. I slowed down and put it in my pocket. Bugs reached out one arm and screamed, Bud, don't stop, run. I started running again, but it felt like my legs were gone. The car with Bugs in it was getting farther and farther away. Finally, I stopped. Bugs was leaning out the door and stopped reaching back for me. He waved and disappeared into the boxcar. A second later, my suitcase came flying out of the door. I walked over to where it landed and picked it up. <clears throat> Man, this is one tough suitcase. You couldn't even tell what it'd been through. It still looked exactly the same. I sat on the side of the tracks and tried to catch my breath. The train and my new pretend brother got farther and farther away, chugging to Chicago. Man, I'd found some family, and he was gone before we could really get to know each other. There were six or seven other people who didn't make the train, so we all walked back toward Hooverville. <clears throat> they must have lit the big fire again. The sky in that direction was glowing orange. That cop that first threw down his billy club walked over to us and said, He wasn't lying about the Flint police coming. They're coming to bust up the shanty town, and you all should get out of here.
when we got close to Hooverville, we heard four gunshots. We all spread into the woods and sneaked up to see what had happened. I peeked from behind a tree and could see a bunch of cops standing around with pistols out. All the men and boys and women that were left in Hooverville were bunched up on one side and the cops were on the other. The fire had been lit and was burning bigger than ever, but now it was burning because all the cops were tearing all the shacks down and were throwing the wood and cardboard and hunks of cloth into the middle of it. One of the cops dragged the big clothes washing pot over to the side and stuck his pistol down in it and shot four more times. Whew, instead of shooting people, they were shooting holes into all the pots and pans. A man was yelling, you yellow belly load lofts, you waited till you knew most of the men was gone, you cowards. The cops wouldn't talk or nothing. They just kept piling Flint's Hooverville into the fire. I tried to see if I could spot Deezum alone, but there were too many people. It seemed like the only good thing that came out of me going to Hooverville was that I finally kissed a girl. Maybe someone was trying to tell me something. What with me missing the train and the blue flyer floating back to me. Maybe Deza Malone was right. Maybe I should stay here in Flint. I walked back farther into the woods and sat down. I pulled the blue flyer out of my pocket and opened my suitcase back up. I smoothed the flyer out, took another good look at it. Maybe it came floating right back to me because this Herman E. Calloway really was my father. Wait a minute, I sat up. The names Caldwell and Calloway are a lot alike. Both of them have eight letters and there aren't too many names that have a C, an A, a L, and a W all together like that. I remembered what I read in that li little big book, Gangbusters. It said, a good criminal chooses an alias that's kind of close to their own name. Except I couldn't figure out who was a criminal here and why anybody needed an alias. I wanted to stay and look for Deza and her mother, but it was too hard to hear with all the people crying and arguing. Besides, I was still on the lam. I started walking. If I hurried, I could get breakfast at the mission. Hope you guys are taking notes about characters and settings. We're going to read chapter 9 also. I got to the food line in plenty of time, but my pretend family wasn't anywhere around. I had to eat by myself without the brown sugar. After I was through, I went back to the library and sat under my tree to wait for it to open. I couldn't stop thinking about Deza Malone and her dimple. How could her father find them now? Finally, I saw people going into the library. The same librarian was there again. I said, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, young man. Could I please borrow a pencil and a piece of paper and see that book about how far one city is from another again, ma'am? She said, of course you may. You know, after I went home last night, I finally recognized you. Didn't you and your mother used to come in here a long time ago? Yes, ma'am. And if I remember correctly, you and your mother had quite different tastes in books. I remember your mother used to like mysteries and fairy tales. Isn't that so? Man, I can't believe she remembered that. And you're the little fellow who used to come in all the time and ask Miss Hill for books about the Civil War, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. She said, I thought so. She handed me the pencil and paper and the city's book and said, And when you're done with the book, bring it back and I have something special for you. She had a huge smile on her face. I said, Thank you, ma'am. But I didn't get too excited because I know the kind of things librarians think are special. I went over to a table and found Flint and Grand Rapids in the lines of the book. I looked for the two lines met and it said 120. Wow, that was going to be a good little walk. 
Next, I wrote down 120, then divided it by five. That came up to 24. That meant I'd have to walk for 24 hours to reach Grand Rapids, one whole day and one whole night. I figured it would be easiest to do the night part first, so I decided to stick around the library until it got dark, then head for Grand Rapids. I wrote down all the names I'd have to of all the cities I'd have to pass through to get there. To get there. All was so Ovid, St. John's, Ionia, and Lowell, and put the paper in my pocket. When I took the city's book back to the librarian, she was still smiling. She said, I bet you've been dying to know what your surprise is, haven't you? I lied. Yes, ma'am. She reached under her desk and pulled out a thick, thick book called The Pictorial History of the War Between the States. Wow, the book was gigantic. Thank you very much, ma'am. She said, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. I took the book back to my table. I didn't want to tell her that I wasn't really interested in history. It was just that the best gory pictures in the world came from the Civil War. And this book was full of them. It really was a great book. <clears throat> There's another thing that's strange about the library. It seems like time flies when you're in one. One second I was opening the first page of the book, hearing the cracking sound the pages make, smelling all the page powder, and reading the, what battle the picture on that page was from. And the next second, the librarian was standing over me saying, I'm very impressed. You really devoured that book, didn't you? But it's time to close now. You may start up again first thing tomorrow. I couldn't believe it. It happened again. I'd spent the whole day reading. Her words snapped a spell that was on me, and my stomach started growling right away. I was going to be too late for the mission. When she was walking me to the door, the librarian stopped at her desk and said, Now, I know that knowledge is a food, but I couldn't help noticing you never went to eat. You must be very hungry. She handed me a paper bag and gave me another smile. Thank you, ma'am. She smiled. See you tomorrow. I said, Yes, ma'am. Thank you for everything. I went back under the Christmas tree and got my suitcase. By this time tomorrow, I'd be looking at the face of the man who had to be my father. I started eating the cheese sandwich the librarian gave me. And then I headed out for Grand Rapids. It's funny how ideas are, in a lot of ways, they're just like seeds. Both of them start real, real small, and then whoop, zoop, sloop. Before you can say Jack Robinson, they've gone and grown a lot bigger than you thought they ever could. If you look at a great big maple tree, it's hard to believe it started out as a little seed. I mean, if you pick up one of those maple tree seeds and turn it over a couple of times in your hand, there's no way your brain will buy that this little thing can grow up into something so big you have to bend your neck back just to see the top of it. Something so big that you can hang a swing on it or build a tree house in it or drive a car into it and kill yourself and any bad luck to passengers that might be taking a ride with you. Ideas are a lot like that. That's what the idea of Herman E. Calloway being my father started as. Something so teeny that if I hadn't paid it no mind, it would have blown away with the first good puff of wind. But now here it was, so big and important and spread out. <clears throat> the idea first got started when I was looking at my suitcase at one of those flyers showing Herman, Herman E. Calloway and his band. That was like the seed falling out of the tree and getting planted. It started busting its head out of the dirt when me and the other boys at the home were getting our nightly teasing from one of, from the biggest bully there, Billy Burns. He said, I don't even belong in this place. I've been put here by mistake, and it ain't going to be long before my mama comes and gets me out. Bugs said, 
Billy, how come it's taken your mama so long to find out where you're at? She must have a real bad memory. Seems like she was the one what dropped you off here. She would have remembered where she left you by now. Billy said, well, 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 will you take a look at who popped up, Mr. Bugs? You know, I've seen a lot of people who have roach-infested houses, but you're the first person I've met who's got a roach-infested head. I wouldn't expect a little ignorant roach head like you to know nothing about folks coming back here to get you out. You don't even have an idea who your mama and daddy is. Any fool you see walking down the street could be them. He looked at the rest of us and said, Seven little boys in this room, and not a one of y'all knows who your folks is. This is sure enough a sad collection of folks here. I said, that's not true. I know who my mama is. I lived with her for six years. Another boy said, me too. I lived with my mama for a long time. Billy Burns said to me, is that right? What about your old man? How many years you live with him? I got a nickel here. You know what it says? Billy stole a nickel from somewhere and he held it up so the buffalo on it was looking out at us. He pretended the buffalo was talking. It had a deep voice like you'd figure a buffalo would. It said, Billy, my man, go ahead and bet this little no mama fool that he don't know who his daddy is. Then I'd have another nickel to bang around in your pocket with. Even before I had a chance to think, I said, You owe me a nickel. My daddy plays a giant fiddle and his name is Herman E. Calloway. And with those words, I didn't even mean to say, that little seed of an idea started growing. The idea got bigger and stronger when I'd sit up at night and wonder why Mama had kept those flyers. It dug its roots in deep and started spreading out when I got old enough to understand that Mama must have known she wasn't going to be around too long and was trying to leave me a message about who my daddy was and why she couldn't ever talk about him. I knew Mama must be too embarrassed about why he wasn't with us and was trying to break it to me gentle. The only trouble was she waited too long. I mean, what other reason could there be for Mama to keep all these things I have in my suitcase and treat them like they were treasures? And why did I know way down in my guts that they were real, real important? So important that I didn't feel comfortable unless I knew where they were all the time. That little idea had gone and sneaked itself into a big, mighty apple, maple, tall enough that if I looked up at the top of it, I'd get a crick in my neck. Big enough for me to hang a climbing rope in. Strong enough that I made my mind to walk clean across the state of Michigan. I opened my suitcase and pulled the flyers out before it got dark. I put the blue one with the writing about Flynn on it in the bottom and looked at the others. Two of them had the same picture of Herman E. Calloway. And the two guys on the first one was called... Herman E. Calloway and the Terminally Unhappy Blues Band. They were called Masters of the Delta Blues. And the other one was called Herman E. Calloway and the Gifted Gents of Gospel, featuring Miss Grace's Blessed Thomas's vocals. Then they were the Servants of the Master's Salvation. The other flyers just had little drawings. The first one was a drawing of an accordion and told about a band named H.E. Kalowski and the wonderful Warblers of Warsaw, who were the masters of the polka. The second one was a picture of some mountains and it told about a band named H.E. Bonnegut and the boisterous big band of Berlin, who were all the masters of all we behold. I put the flyers back in the suitcase and stood up. Just like bugs, I was going west. Okay, hope you added lots of information about characters and settings. That seemed like a long one, boys and girls. Oh my goodness, that was almost an hour. I'll have to give you guys some time during class.